Welcome to the GIVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Julia Rothkopf, and I am the Program Associate at GIVO. Today, we have Jessica Kierzane and Anita Norwich joining us to discuss the publication of Jessica Kierzane's newly released translation of Miriam Karpilov's A Provincial Newspaper and Other Stories, um, newly published on Syracuse University Press. For those who do not know GIVO, we are a very special place for the celebration, contemplation, and exploration of Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture. We're located in New York City, where our library and archive contains over 24 million documents and 400,000 books. These resources are used by researchers all, all around the world. We also have tons of classes on Yiddish language and culture, um, which actually just started. So if you wanna learn Yiddish, see the link in the chat um, and also public programs just like this one where we aim to bridge the worlds of Jewish culture and our vast library and archival holdings. So we're very excited to have you all joining us today for our book talk. Jessica Kierzane is the Assistant Instructional Professor of Yiddish at the University of Chicago. She's Editor-in-Chief for Ingeveb, a Journal of Yiddish Studies, her academic work and translations have appeared in various publications. She's a trans translator of Miriam Karpilov's Diary of a Lonely Girl or the Battle Against Free Love. Um, she was also, yes, um, there's the book and we also sell it in the Yibo store, which August will, colleague August will put a link in the chat. Um, Dr. Kierzane was also a 2017 Translation Fellow and 2018 Pedagogy Fellow at the Yiddish Book Center. She earned her PhD in Yiddish Studies from Columbia University in 2017. And we also have Anita Norwich with us. She is Collegiate Professor Emerita of English and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. She is the Gerstein Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Toronto in fall 2023, so right now. She is a translator of Two Feelings by Celia Dropkin, which is a forthcoming book, Fear and Other Stories by Hannah Blankstein, and A Jewish Refugee in New York by Katia Molodovsky. Um, she is also the write, author of Writing in Tongues, Yiddish Translation in the 20th Century, Discovering Exile, Yiddish and Jewish American Literature in America During the Holocaust, The Homeless Imagination in the Fiction of Israel, Josh, Joshua Singer, and co-editor of Languages of Modern Jewish Study, sorry, Modern Jewish Cultures, Comparative Perspectives, Jewish Literatures and Cultures, Context and Intertext, and Gender and Text in Modern Hebrew and Yiddish Literatures. She translates Yiddish literature and teaches lectures and publications, sorry, and publishers, publishes on a range of topics concerning modern Jewish cultures, Yiddish language and literature, Jewish American literature, and Holocaust literature. So thank you both for being here, and I will turn it over to Anita and Jessica. Thank you very much, Julia. I thought I'd sent you the short uh, trial, but I guess it's late. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, and congratulations uh, once again. I love saying congratulations to you. Um, <laughs> published um, another work uh, by uh, Miriam Karpilov. Uh, we've talked about this before. I don't know how many people who were on this webinar um, have heard both of us or either of us on this subject. But it is no secret that there have been more translations of women prose writers in the past decade or two than in the century before. Um, uh, and we've both joined others who are translating uh, women prose writers into English. And we, uh, neither of us, I, correct me if I'm uh, overstepping here, uh, but neither of us who, we have some years between us, um, I never had a female prose writer on any Yiddish list that I was given. And you've told me that you have not right. um, either. Um, and I, for one, couldn't believe that women hadn't written novels. I was an English graduate student. They must, there were lots of women. Um, and uh, like you, I wanted to know what women's perspectives on their world was, you know, re war, revolution, modernity, emigration, life. Uh, you've certainly uh, discussed all of those, uh, both in your introductions and Karpilov herself in the texts uh, that you've translated. And I, I was struck by a number of recurring themes, not just in... Um, a provincial newspaper and other stories, but in the other two uh, works 
um, that uh, that you've translated, and they and I, I'd like you to add to this list if you would. Um, there are always bad marriages. There are, you'll pardon me on on the Zoom. There are useless um, or worse men. Uh, there's a lot of misogyny, and there uh, there's a, a good deal of attention to the political and cultural tensions of the day. Uh, so. I'd like to ask you if, if these seem accurate to you, if you want to add more, um, and also to ask you what drew you, what continues to draw you to Miriam Karpilov? Yeah, I would just add to that list the one other thing, which maybe is less in Diary of a Lonely Girl, but really comes out in provincial newspaper, which is um, an attention to women's lives outside of romantic relationships as well, um, especially uh, provincial newspaper, which is very much about a working woman and her her workplace environment. What drew me to Miriam Karpilov? Like you, um, as you said, like I didn't, I hadn't read any women prose writers. And I will say that I also didn't notice that I hadn't read any women prose writers. Um, I simply read what I was, you know, told were the good things to read. And was writing my dissertation and only later did I go back and look and notice that all of the prose writers that I cited uh, who were women uh, had written in English and I had two chapters one that was or four chapters two of them that dealt with things in English and two of them that dealt with things in Yiddish and the things in Yiddish were all by men and the things in English were all by women uh, and so it was this kind of strange uh, language gender politics that I had built up for myself that had actually no basis in reality um, that were only based in, in what had been made available to me in an explicit way. Um, so I started reading Miriam Karpilov's Diary of a Lonely Girl by way of a fluke. I um, was looking to base, to write a footnote for my dissertation. Uh, one of my readers had told me that I needed to better define the term free love uh, and so I went to the Yiddish Book Center's website and I typed in Kaya Liebe in the search box. This was before they even had the OCR feature. Uh, and so just simply title searches and the, um, the subtitle for Diary of a Lonely Girl is The Battle Against Free Love. So it was the second hit. Um, and I opened it up and didn't know what I was getting and started reading it. And it was lively and hilarious and um, really very similar to the kinds of things that I like to read in English and unlike anything I had ever read in Yiddish. Um, and I had this like very kind of personal sense of affinity and surprise that I could hear a voice in Yiddish who sounded so much like mine. Um, I had this kind of understanding that Yiddish was going to be a more sort of distant pursuit for me as a, as a um, so that was actually pretty profound for me. Um, and I started translating and I happened to be at a moment in my career when uh, I was done with the dissertation. I wasn't ready to pursue it as an academic monograph. I was looking for something sort of in between. And so I, I, um, I thought I would take up the project of translating and with the support of the Yiddish Book Center's translation fellowship, which was um, extraordinarily helpful. Uh, and I really fell in love with her. Um, I couldn't put her down. I was done translating the book. It already was uh, waiting for copy editing and I couldn't stop translating her. Um, and so I was away at summer camp and I, I translated Judith while my kids were playing in the pool somewhere. Um, and I just, I couldn't, I was so captivated by her and I so enjoyed writing with her in her voice as a translator uh, that I couldn't stop. So, <laughs> so here I am, and I translated most of a provincial newspaper through the uh, difficult pandemic days. Um, and um, so it feels like a particular accomplishment to have achieved anything at all during, those, during that time. Uh, but it was really this kind of um, uh, just sense of like real pleasure in, in reading her and, and bringing her to life. Can I ask you? Can I ask you to to expand expand on something? You said that um, reading her was unlike anything that you ever read in Yiddish. Can you yeah. say more about that? Part of it, I think, 
uh, was that she was addressing issues that I liked to read about in, um, so it was a, a, top, a, a matter of topics. So she was writing about women's perspectives on romance. She was writing about being a young woman in New York City, things that I could relate to from my own personal experience, even though, of course, uh, decades before I encountered them. Um, so it had to do with perspective um, and genre. I hadn't read a lot of I know that many things exist. It's simply my own personal experience of what I had read. I hadn't read a lot of um, sort of romance stories in Yiddish um, or specifically, not so much romance, specifically about this kind of like dating world as opposed to a kind of more um, traditional relationship structure. Um, but a lot of it had to do with tone uh, and her sense of humor, um, which there were many perhaps many more male humorists uh, than there were female humorists, but I hadn't read many of them either. So the opportunity to, um, to read someone whose um, one of her goals was to make her readers laugh or roll their eyes um, was really freeing. Now that you've mentioned tone, um, I was struck by the ways in which you describe her tone in various places, and it, both in articles and in introductions to your books. You you uh, call it you, you refer to it as being a bemused, urbane, funny, sharp, sassy. I'm wondering what particular challenges that would have posed for you as a translator. Yeah, I I guess it took me a long time to decide that that's what her tone was uh, actually at the beginning, especially because I think she takes some time settling into it herself. So some of her earlier writing, I think Judith, uh, which is her first novel, doesn't have the same sharpness to it. Uh, you can see it here and there, but it is a little bit more sincere and also a little bit more melodramatic. Um, and the beginning pages, the beginning chapters of Diary of a Lonely Girl also have this kind of melancholic, um, tone. And then she settles into this acerbic kind of um, uh, take no nonsense kind of uh, um, high, mightier, higher, higher than thou kind of uh, uh, tone that I find so pleasurable to read and to recreate. And it, it took me a while to recognize it. Um, but when I did... I captured it. I mean, it's very clear yeah. uh, from the English um, how how well you've captured it. That was something I admired. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of, I think, what makes it so fun to translate the same writer so much. By the time I was translating a provincial newspaper, um, I already had kind of a voice of hers in my head. I had read also at that point some of her personal letters, which had a similar kind of tone. Um, and so I already, I didn't have to kind of decide, oh, is she being sarcastic here or is she taking it seriously? I kind of knew when she says something, it's almost always sarcastic. And so then I can kind of figure out how to, how to create that. So th this, um, this volume, which you can't see because I'm on floor, <laughs> I'm not in my own home. Um, uh, this volume has the novella, provincial newspaper, and then it has 19 other short stories. Can you say a word about how you chose those 19 and yeah. what holds them together for you? Yeah, well, it's so great to be doing this at YIVO because it is because of YIVO that I uh, I know knew which 19 stories. Um, Marion Karpolev has an archive at YIVO um, and I really did not know this when I started working on her, but it turns out that I was perhaps, you know, the luckiest researcher that ever was because at her, in her archive at Evo, she has two handwritten lists of everything that she ever wrote, the year, the date, and the newspaper, um, and also scrapbooks of her writing where she clipped um, newspaper clippings of, of her writing. Um, and some of it, including things that are unattributed, things that have mem coup as the as the signature. And so I, you know, I know that she wrote lists of jokes, for instance, um, which maybe would have been otherwise impossible to identify, except that she cut them and put them in her scrapbook. Um, but one of the scrapbooks says at the top, um, 
Je Klebenesh written collected stories and um, or selected stories, and uh, it has a, a table of contents with a handwritten list of stories. And those are 19 stories that she published in the Forberts in the 1930s. And then it pastes, pastes all of them in, in that order. And I kept her selection of stories. I figured she liked these best. She wanted them maybe in a volume in her, her uh, letters later in life. She says she, there's so many projects that she wished she could do and never managed to do, whether because there was a lack of interest or because of her own failing health. Uh, and I think one of them was publishing her collected stories. Um, but I changed the order of the stories because I felt like they were the order that she that she put them in um, was not as helpful for for readers. I wanted to group them roughly according to subject matter and maybe also give some kind of trajectory to them. Um, can you can you? I mean, I know you've read the the letters and you've been in the archive and. Um, I, I, I wonder how you would describe her reputation during her own lifetime and since. Yeah. So during her own lifetime, my sense is that she was uh, quite popular. Um, it's I don't have a lot of um, good evidence for how many people read her, except that it was fairly unusual for someone who wrote a serialized novel in the newspaper to then have that printed in book form. And so even just the fact that her books exist in book form is already a, a good piece of evidence um, and also were advertised in the newspaper and so forth. Her, her picture was always next to her writing. And so there's a kind of like celebrity aspect to her, I believe. Uh, and also her novels in the newspapers were often advertised as the famous Die Berimte Schreiberin uh, Miriam Krakulov. And so um, she is a selling point. For these newspapers, um, how many, so that suggests suggests how many of her books were published as how many of her works were published in book form? Five. And are you going to translate the other two? One of them I don't like very much, okay. <laughs> so I don't think that one I will. One is a play, uh, Die Sturm Tag. It was published in 1905. It's one of her very first things. It's extremely sincere. It is not at all funny. Uh, it doesn't sound like the Miriam Karpolov that I um, am familiar with. And yet maybe I will translate it. Uh, I keep saying that I'm done with Miriam Karpolov and I'm going to move on to someone else, but then I keep translating her. Uh, so uh, it's possible. So uh, you've described how famous, how well known, how uh, what a selling point she was in her own lifetime. Why do you think she went out of favor? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is um, that she was writing mostly the kind of fiction that appeared in periodicals, especially toward the end, you know, the end of her writing career, she was writing a lot of short stories that were kind of one and done. They were in the newspaper and then, um, and then they weren't in a, in a book. It's harder to find her. Um, and toward the end of her life, she was living in Bridgeport, Connecticut uh, with her, with her brother and felt quite cut off from the Yiddish literary community. And so even in her own lifetime, there was this sense of kind of like being a has-been, um, that she was writing these kind of like hyper-contemporary things that were following her readers in the lives that they were living and had somehow fallen out of that. And that's something I think has to do with also the, the role of kind of aging women uh, and the way that that maybe they are, they're viewed as uh, less relevant. Um, and so I think that she she uh, experienced some age discrimination in addition to um, uh, on the basis of her her gender. Um, I think also Yiddish writers in general experienced a lack of stability, male or female, uh, because the 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 uh, world of Yiddish letters and especially Yiddish newspapers was in this kind of um, uh, shrinking um uh, sense even you know in the, in the 1940s I think that it was um there was a feeling of a concern of a fewer and fewer opportunities uh, at least as she experienced it so she was trying to kind of keep her finger in it and couldn't um but also you know later on as you know as uh, after she passed away um almost no critics ever wrote about her 
as a serious writer in her own lifetime. I think I found one piece of literary criticism about her. Um, her books were not easily available until the Yiddish Book Center started digitizing things. There aren't so many copies of them. It's not like they were getting reprinted. They weren't um, valued in that way. Um, and so she was hard to find um, until all of a sudden with digitization, she became very easy to find. And I just had to type in Freya Liebe and there she was. Um, so I, I think it was a what brought her back was a sort of serendipitous uh, combination of technology um, and also the very hard work of people who have preserved her, such as the archivist Ivo and uh, the folks at the Yiddish Book Center, um, and also a growing interest among um, scholars who are looking for women and, and what they wrote. I, 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 should, uh, I should have said this earlier, I suppose, but um, we, I, I mentioned the, the changes that have happened in the field uh, since I and you entered it. Um, and certainly credit where credit is due, the digitization of Yiddish literature and the fact that there's now OCR recognition kind of um, is uh, is extraordinary and really uh, accounts for a lot of the changes um, that we've been able to see. Um, I, I, to come back to, to Karpala, I know you've taught her before uh, in your own classes and so have many of us. How do your students respond to her? Yeah, I was so... Um thrilled and surprised, it, you know, this was my very first book and I didn't really know what to expect, the diary was, um, and I assumed that it wasn't going to get much traction, um, but it has really been taken up enthusiastically in a number of classrooms and by students. And I think part of what makes it so, well, there are no, one is that it came out, I was translating it, it came out right around the Me Too um, kind of, uh, um, uh, explosion of interest in, in stories about women's uh, experiences in the workplace and sexual harassment. Um, and it is very much about that. It feels like a, a Me Too novel uh, about the dating scene in the 19 teens in New York. And so um, in that way, it really resonates with what people are thinking about in a kind of social political sense and with the language that students have for describing their, uh, their own experiences. And in a lot of ways, the narrator um, feels like she could be a college student. She lives in something, a small room that feels kind of like a dorm room. There's like thin walls and, um, and people barging in all the time and uh, questions about reputation and who thinks what about her. There's this kind of feeling that like it's You're too small about a world. world. This is the diary, the diary of a lonely girl. Yeah, and so, um, so I have this sense that students can kind of pick up on the ways in which she feels like she, her experience feels like it could be similar to theirs. And also I think her sense of humor uh, is very resonant in our current yeah. moment. What's that? Get her sense of humor? I think so. I think she would have been really good at Twitter. Like she yeah. has this kind of, um, this eye rolly uh, sensibility that I think is, actually um, it may ha may not have always been in fashion, but I think it really was in fashion in the 1910s, 1920s, and especially in American literature, kind of Dorothy Parker, witticism sensibility. And I think that has come back around. Um, and so she uh, fits well with student sensibility. I think they get her um, and get excited about what she, what she represents. Um, I'm interested, I haven't taught anything from a provincial newspaper and other stories. And I am very curious about how that will work in the classroom and what students will think of um, the short stories, the memoir, which we haven't mentioned yet, um, which there's a couple of chapters from her memoir in here, um, which I think are quite rich for um, maybe a history classroom instead of a literature classroom, which could be um, an interesting way to position her. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't have experience of knowing what, what students will think, but that's yet to come. That, that will come soon, I think. I, I, I just, this is sort of a commercial interruption. I don't mean it in that. <laughs> but when you said uh, the serendipitous combination of the Me Too moment and 
um, and and uh, Diary of a Lonely Girl, I had exactly the same experience with the Molodovsky, mm. the refugee moment. Yeah. It, yeah. Moments like this, both Me Too, the refugee, um, and, and others, we really are speaking to a much broader audience than most people think we have a right to, well, I shouldn't say that, than um, might be expected, right? I mean, yeah. I'm sure I know others have taught it to audiences that don't know Yiddish and aren't necessarily Jewish and still find something to hold on to in these stories um, that uh, makes them think of their own experiences, that refers back to their own experiences. And I think that's, that's yeah. a wonderful. And also grounds them historically, you know, as a way of saying uh, we didn't invent me too it didn't it that the part of what makes it so painful is how how ongoing it is that we were you know encountering these same issues a uh, hundred years ago and that something a hundred years ago could feel so um, completely relevant and relatable now suggests the longevity of the problem and I think the same can be said of, of the, uh, the the Molodovsky um, where these these issues um, keep coming back around in ways that are really painful, but that maybe these books can help us understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, do you have some way of, in, in addition to serendipity, it, I mentioned at the very beginning that there's been this burgeoning of, of um, uh, translations of women writers in the last 10 or 20 years. Yeah. How do you understand that? That is why, how do you understand why it's happening and why it's happening now? Um, maybe some of it has to do with that. They say that Jewish studies and maybe Yiddish studies is always just like a, a little bit behind the curve. Uh, think, and so- I think it's always ahead and everybody follows, <laughs> but okay. Um, that the kind of uh, literary recovery of women writers is something that I, I associate really with the, uh, in English literature with maybe the 1990s um, as being a kind of um, a high point of it. Although I think it's still ongoing very much. Um, and so maybe first we had to prove that Yiddish was valuable as an object of study in itself. And then we could get around to the women. There's a kind of um, arc there uh, I think maybe it also has to do with kind of, um, uh, again, a kind of trying to prove the worth of Yiddish literature by looking at great works as opposed to now a, a desire to kind of turn toward popular culture um, and, and maybe um, diversify the kind of texts that we're looking at in terms of genre, which then opens up uh, the kind of genres that, that women found it uh, more possible to publish in. Um, what, what, I, what yeah, genres? I mean, I think also just, um, my sense is that more and more people are studying Yiddish in universities. And so, uh, that opens it up to, and many of them women or people with, uh, diverse gender identities. And so they are looking for, uh, writers who maybe share their perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there writers, uh, Yiddish, I mean, you mentioned Dorothy Parker, who obviously is not a Yiddish writer, but are there um, writers, either Yiddish or not, with whom you would put her in conversation? That is who you think of as, I mean, I, I know that you, I mean, and, and I guess a corollary of the question is, since you read so many of the letters and since you've been in the archives, lived in the archives, who was she in fact in touch with? Yeah. Um, so I'll say that I think, uh, she had a kind of, especially early on in her career, she had a kind of click or Audre or something of humorist writers. Um, so she was, she was hanging out with the folks at the Kibitzer, Gorsa Kundis. Um, there's even cartoons of her hanging out at the beach <laughs> with people, with Celia Dropkin, um, uh, as well. Uh, so I think that uh, I might put her in conversation with um, uh, Yossel Cutler, for instance. Um, but she also was was very, um, she was part of the world of, of newspapers. Um, 
and variety of sort of journalists as well as uh, literary writers. Um, and I think there are women that she felt great affinity toward. So Bertha Kling is one of them. Um, she was very close to Rose uh, Schomer Bachelis, uh, who was Schomer's, uh, the, the popular Yiddish writer's uh, daughter and was a playwright in her own. Um, and, um, and I think she also um, had some writers that she felt competitive with. I don't have good evidence for this, but my sense is that perhaps uh, Sarah Smith might have been one such writer because they both wrote uh, for the tug around the same time. And Sarah Smith, I think, ended up staying longer and becoming more, uh, more popular there. Uh, and I, my sense is that there was a kind of way in which Yiddish, write, Yiddish newspapers felt they could only have one woman writer <laughs> um, and for that to be the kind of representative popular woman writer. Uh, and so uh, I think that was a, a way that did create a kind of feeling of competition between women as opposed to a kind of solidarity between them. Um, but I don't have, as I said, good evidence for that. It's just a kind of gut feeling um, that I have. Yeah. Um, it, I'm, I, I'm fascinated by book covers. Um, I think they tell all sorts of stories. Um, and could you uh, post the cover? I mean, could you yes. share a screen I of that up close? Okay. Um, um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. You just do that as a slideshow. So we, yeah. 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 So here's the, the book cover of the, the translation. Right. What's going on? on this yeah, screen? it's very busy. Very um, and there's a lot and I can sort of figure out some of it, but not all of it. So yeah. Well, so I really love the book cover. Um, and I'll show you uh, something else, which maybe helps illustrate why. So I mentioned that um, Miriam Karpilov, uh has in her archive at Evo several scrapbooks. Mm -hmm. Um, and in her scrapbooks, she includes many, many um, pieces of her writing. And inside the scrapbooks, this is a cover of one of the scrapbooks inside will also be um, the, the newspaper clippings, but then also little images, parts of postcards, often they're flowers, uh, but, but sometimes they are um, historical personalities or people in her family, or um, um, often they are sculptures that she likes. Uh, images and sculptures that she likes surrounding her writing. Um, and so the, in some ways, the, um, the um, cover of the translation echoes that, um, and you can see little hearts and little flowers and things, which kind of are, are a motif that she used a lot. She also had personal stationery that had little roses on it that she used for her personal letters. Um, and here are pictures of her, the famous writer, again, looks kind of like it's clipped from something. Uh, but then we also have um, scenes that kind of evoke what you might find inside of the book. So um, scenes that have, you know, city scenes is a very urban writing and um, it, images that uh, have to do with American Zionism uh, in this period. And the, the memoir that's in the, in the middle of the, the part two of the book is about her time in Palestine. And so it kind of gestures toward some of the um, eclectic content inside the book. Um, through the cover. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'm remembering this correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong. She did some of her own translations that you were not entirely enamored of, let's just say. <laughs> I'm curious about this because I've, I've read other, you know, self-translations of women uh, who translated their own works into, into English. And I've never been really happy with them. Yeah. Uh, how do you find her own translations? So I don't think she started, I mean, I don't know, but I, I because they're undated, but the manuscripts that I have uh, seen of her writing in English, uh, trans self-translating, um, I think she did them kind of later in life. At the same time as she's writing to people, friends saying that her English is not that good. I don't think that's true. She has beautiful English. Her English sounds better than my English. Um, it's very polished. She's very well read. 
Um, and at times it's, it, I felt like it was translating uh, her writing in a way that was pitching it similarly to the kind of writing that she was reading. Um, and I wanted to translate her novels for today's audiences. The books just sounded old. They sounded like they were written in the 1920s. Um, and I didn't feel like I needed to do that um, the, in order to bring them out to today's audiences. And so the, the Judith, which I have here, which we haven't really talked about, which is um, the second translation of first that I did, it's, um, it's her very first novel. And she translated that one in full into English. And I didn't look at it until after I had already translated it. And then I compared my manuscript to her handwritten manuscript. And sometimes I took her suggestions. Um, I, there were some things that I either had gotten wrong or just I liked the way she said it. Um, but often I felt that I needed to kind of bring her forward in time a little bit in terms of her language in order to make this um, the most resonant book for the readers that I was imagining. Yeah, no, I, I completely I get that. Um, English, you know, languages change, and what yeah. was made in the 1920s will sound, may sound very much off. I mean, there's a reason that there are scores of translations of Don Quixote and of Shalom Aleichem um, and, uh, and others, because language changes. And you're, you, you've, without using contemporary slang or any of that uh, pander, what might be considered pandering stuff, you've really spoken to, in, in English, to a contemporary audience. Yeah, um, I mean, a, a very clear example of that is that she uses very formal language in her English translations. She's also mm -hmm. got this beautiful penmanship. It just, the whole thing looks so beautiful um, and pristine and careful in a way that feels like a learned language. Um, it feels like someone who really had to study to get at this language. Um, and I'm sloppy because I'm a native speaker. So I used a lot of um, contractions, for instance. She would say, you cannot do such and such. And it just felt too lofty. To yeah. Me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you see the narrative voice changing through these three, well, there's more than three works now, but through all of the uh, works that you've um, that you've translated by her? Yeah, I think I see an arc from melodrama toward realism. Um, I see her getting much more confident in herself um, and much more, I think, critical um, of the world around her, maybe jaded. Um, there's a kind of bitterness or or um, um, disillusion, I think, that happens uh, more in the later stories than in the earlier ones. Um, if, yeah, I mean, that's in broad strokes. I think that's kind of our trajectory. I, I want to go back to a question I, I probably didn't phrase uh, strongly enough before uh, about the challenges of translating her. What were the challenges of translating her, or did it just sort of flow after a while? Uh, she loves to poke fun at people. And, um, and again, like that's hard to, um, make sure that I'm being clear that she's made, telling a joke, but one of the ways that she pokes fun at people is about their language. She's very, very language. She's okay. very dialogue heavy. And in her dialogue, she's, she has a way of, she does this particular kind of joke where she lets someone, lets a character talk for too long until they make themselves ridiculous. And then the, the author, it feels like, is sort of sitting back and, and letting this character loose uh, until you recognize how preposterous they are. And so there's a kind of overblown language that you have to then recreate um, without her sort of saying so, he said in an overblown way. Um, and so there's a, um, that kind of bloviating was hard to, to uh, really kind of like double down on and emphasize. Um, but also she makes fun of how people use the variety of languages that, that Yiddish speakers were speaking. So she has um, a great example is when in the memoir, she arrives in, um, in Palestine and um, an agent, a British agent is asking her why she came. And he's very incredulous because it's a moment of economic crisis 
And he doesn't understand why someone who has an American passport, she's already a naturalized American citizen, would be, and I should say, and I have a copy of her naturalization papers. Her, her nephew gave me her naturalization paper with the Palestine stamp on the back, which is t- totally crazy. Um, this is hanging in my office. So, um, right, so she, she shows up and the British agent is very um, skeptical. And he says, well, why did you come here? Is it really so bad in America that you would come here of all places? And then she responds in English, historical connections, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, which is so funny, especially especially when you're reading it in Yiddish and then all of a sudden she breaks into English to say this like extremely understated and casual speech. I just burst out laughing. Historical connections, you know? So like, what do I do with that? How can I give that kind of feeling of like incongruous break from the narrative that happens when someone says something in English in Yiddish? Um, in this particular case, I just left it in English just like everything else because I felt like it was such a funny statement that it talked even though um, it doesn't have that language transition. But sometimes I do have to say, she said in English or something like that to kind of indicate that shift. Uh, And the same thing happens with other languages. Characters will say a word here in Russian to show how educated they are or um, in the Palestine memoir, someone will, will say something in Hebrew um, in modern Ivrit, in order to show their Zionism, she has a, a brother-in-law who insists on being called Moshe instead of Moshe, uh, and so that was very. I, I kind of over enunciated it by giving it a M O S H E H to kind of try to make sure that readers were seeing that he was really doubling down on the Moshe, even though they're speaking in Yiddish. Um, and so that was that was really tricky to kind of bring the the social meaning, the, the understanding of what those languages bear with them uh, into English. What, um, I, I've often thought about this uh, and not sure that there's an answer uh, or one answer. What difference do you think it makes um, to our sense of Yiddish literary history to or Yiddish culture, Yiddish literature in general, it, what what difference do her works make in your mind, and what difference do these tra- these multiple uh, translations of uh, women uh, prose writers make to our understanding of Yiddish literature? That's a very good question. <laughs> we'll end, we'll end with something small. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I think it simply gives us a more realistic picture of what the literature is, um, including what people were actually reading, right? Especially because this is literature that appeared in newspapers, um, probably had a much wider circulation than something like uh, uh, the poet poetry journals of de Junge. Uh, and so actual Yiddish readers are sitting at their kitchen tables, uh, especially, especially the stories that at, at the end of um, a provincial newspaper, I really was picturing my great grandmother who um, I know read the Forverts in the same years. And so thinking about, well, this is what she read, right? So when we talk about Yiddish literature, it doesn't have to be um, you know, something that uh, has a, a infrastructure of importance. And instead it can be about um, how this literature actually spoke to people and about people in their daily lives. Um, so I think that that's one of many answers that a person could give to the question, but that is among them, <laughs> uh, is to kind of just give a better picture. And, and it also uh, forces us to ask what important means in this yeah. context, right? Uh, how, how, who is determining it and uh, how is it being determined? Yeah. Uh, before we turn to the audience questions, uh, can I ask what your next project or projects are likely to be that we can- Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'm really in between things. If anyone has suggestions, I'm I'm thinking about working on um, Chicago Yiddish writers. And there is um, a novel just now that I'm reading. It's actually in English by a woman named Beatrice Bisno uh, called Tomorrow's Bread. Um, her father was a labor organizer, was one of the 
um, the founding organizers of the um, ILGWU, and it's about his life in Chicago. Getting very excited about it, but I have this way of getting like uh, very excited about a project and then realizing that jumping to the next one too fast before I do anything with it. So that's what I, I would say today is I'm thinking about working on her and this one. Uh, but ask me again tomorrow and I might have a different answer. I haven't settled on it yet. The truth is that I fell so hard in love with Miriam Harpelov that having decided to be done um, has left me a little bit at sea. Well, I hope I hope the um, the next project, even if not the very next one, includes translations because that 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 too is a real contribution um, uh, to the field and to our classrooms. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open this. Uh, I remind you that the questions should be posed in the Q and A um, uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. And I'm going to just read a couple of these. Yeah. Uh, did her writing mirror in any way her own life experience? We know the answer. Go ahead. Yeah, she. I mean, it absolutely did. Um, she, especially, I think, a provincial newspaper is um, very clearly about her life as a woman working in um, in the Asia newspaper. She lampoons it. I think she exaggerates, uh, but um, it's it's very clear that it is based in in the reality of her um, experience. And it takes place in Boston. And she herself went to Boston and worked for a small Yiddish newspaper in Boston for a little while. And uh, I told, I mentioned that she has this list of everything she ever wrote, but when she gets to the Boston one, she says something like 30 articles in this Boston newspaper that I don't care about. And then she goes <laughs> back to her list so that I, it feels like there's a lot of, um, of connection uh, between her own experience and this, uh, this very silly narrative <laughs> about her time uh, at the Boston newspaper. But overall, I think in, um, she really was writing from um, her own experience and also things that she observed in the community around her. Um, there's a, a question from someone who co-chairs the Lifelong Learning Committee uh, at her synagogue in Milwaukee. And she's asking, uh, how, how did you become interested in Yiddish to begin with? Um, and uh, she's got people clamoring to learn Yiddish, but can't find a teacher in Milwaukee. That's surprising. Uh, so how did you become interested and what's behind all this recent interest in Yiddish among Jews of all ages? Um, I became interested in Yiddish. Um, perhaps I was always theoretically interested in Yiddish, but I became interested in Yiddish in a serious way. Uh, when I was a college student, I was getting a major in Jewish studies and a major in English literature, starting to write about um, Jewish literature in English. Um, and I saw an advertisement for the Yiddish Book Center's summer program and thought, well, you know, that could be handy when I'm writing about Philip Roth or whatever it was that I was thinking I would write about, um, of all people. And um, so I, I did a summer program and uh, I really fell in love with um, the people who were working on Yiddish, this kind of like sense of, of uh, community and importance that people put on their work. Uh, I really just was inspired by it, wanted to be a part of it. And that was the beginning for me. Um, why do, Why is there so much interest in it now? Um, I have some theories <laughs> um, that have to do with the internet um, and the way that these uh, disparate communities of learners uh, can connect with one another now um, in ways that they couldn't before. I think there may have been a lot of latent interest and curiosity previously, but people didn't feel like it was a live option to learn Yiddish. There was a sense of like, oh, well, I want to learn Yiddish, but where could I possibly do that? Whereas now you can Google, where can I learn Yiddish and find an answer right away? Um, so I, I think it's become much more accessible. Um, and that has that has tapped into a kind of latent interest, which then has uh, grown. Um, there may be other good answers as well, but I think, I think again, the serendipity of technology or the existence of the available technology is a really big part of it. Huge part. No, I agree. Um, there's a there's a, a kind of lengthy question that I'll try to um, uh, ask quickly. Uh, this is by someone who's uh, started to notice the pattern of various Jewish authors, men and women, of the early to mid uh, 20th century, pre-World War II 20th century, 
who were well known in their era and almost entirely forgotten later on. Can you say a bit about why she and some other authors are forgotten, whereas others enter the canon? That's yeah, a question. Go ahead. it's a hard question. Um, what gets translated has, I think, a lot to do with it, right? And and who is in a position to translate and get published for translating? Um, and so the um, that I think has to do with markets, what people think there will be a market for, and who do you have to convince that something is important enough, right? And so if a, if a, if a book publisher thinks it won't sell, then you can't get the manuscript through. So it, I think it's a it's a it's a um, a number of factors and not any one particular factor. Um, so Shalom Aleichem has been translated over and over again. There's a market for Shalom Aleichem in part because he was already a household name, in part because he then became again a household name because of the bar on the roof, right? And so um, those kinds of major cultural events uh, and then people have come to expect because of Shalom Aleichem from, and, and other things because of American Jewish nostalgia that uh, Yiddish literature will look a particular way. It will have um, matchmakers and goats and whatever. Uh, and so those pieces of literature that follow those expectations might be easier to get published or get noticed. Um, yeah. Certainly getting a Nobel Prize doesn't hurt in, uh, in having recognition as well. No, it doesn't. Um, although it's, it's probably worth noting here uh, that uh, uh, literary tastes change quite dramatically. And within Yiddish culture, there was a time when Shalom Aleichem went out of favor because he was too alt-Frankish, you know, too old-fashioned for the modernists. Um, uh, I.B. Singer actually uh, would have felt that way, I mean, and, and uh, said as much. Um, uh, <laughs> Are you interested in teaching a Yivo course focused on Karpilov? <laughs> some of the Yivo people are here. This, that's a very- <laughs> If they would agree, I would agree. <laughs> would you teach a course on Karp I, I don't mean to put Yivo on the spot, but um, do you oh, think- Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm teaching a course on Karpilov? I'm teaching a course this winter at the University of Chicago to my Yiddish language students. One of my students, um, I asked him, what, what does he want to study? And he said, I figure I should study with you the thing you know most about. So will you do a whole class on Miriam Karpilov? And I, I could have, I mean, if it were permitted, I would have kissed him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, yeah I, I feel like I have quite a lot, obviously, to say about her. But also, um, I, you can learn a lot about history through her as well. She writes about immigration and about um the Holocaust in kind of interesting ways, in this kind of sideways way. Um, she writes about um, the Russian Revolution and a kind of, again, like this sideways way where her focus is always on women and their love lives often, but you get these peaks of history around the edges, which I think is also really interesting. So yeah, for sure, I have a lot uh, that I think, I think you could teach, a person could teach a course on her. I could teach a course on her. And I hope you get to do that. <laughs> Somewhere, not saying where that should be. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're getting to the end of our time together, uh, unless there are more questions that people want to pose that I haven't seen yet. Um, but maybe this is a, too broad a question, but uh, is there something that you wish uh, had come up in this conversation, something that you want to say about her that we haven't touched? Um, there's something about something that happens really in the middle of this book that I find really important about Miriam Karpilov, uh, which is, so she's in the memoir, um, she writes about her family's arrival in Palestine and she really focuses in on these small details, what it's like to get an inoculation against polio, all these kind of little things. Um, but there's a moment where she is having a conversation with her sister-in-law um, about the um, her sister-in-law's life and she's settled in Palestine and what will it, her life be like? She's, you know, kind of concerned about um, her role as a homemaker when she's living in a hotel and various things. And the conversation turns to fertility issues. Um, and there's this frank and really moving uh, uh, discussion of fertility issues in Miriam Karpilov's family that her brother had previously um, had married a, a woman who died in childbirth 
And then his second wife had some significant fertility issues and ended up in the hospital and I think had a hysterectomy and then she couldn't have children. And, um, and it really took my breath away um, because it was so uh, frank and open and, um, and really addressed the kind of how painful this was for the sister-in-law and how she questioned what her role could be as a wife because she wanted children and could she have them. And um, it's not like the topic of the memoir, so it could really be easily missed. And so I wanted to kind of point readers' attention to it because I think it's a really, especially now, really an important issue. I, that's something that I think uh, we've all been struck by um, or people that I talked to have been struck by, uh, how um, forward thinking and how contemporary a lot of these works feel, right? I mean, yeah. it, you mentioned um, the Me Too movement and, the, and I mentioned the refugee movement um, or the refugee crisis. Uh, and uh, we've talked in the past, not on this, on this uh, webinar, um, about uh, the frankness of some of these women uh, about abortion and about yeah. sexuality um, and uh, hear about uh, infertility. Uh, I think, I, I guess I'm answering uh, the question that I asked uh, before about what we get out of um, reading these women, which is uh, obviously another perspective, but also a, a kind of surprising frankness about these particular issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll plug, put another plug in for Evo because the, uh, the memoir uh, that I translated only exists in, as a handwritten document. Uh, in Miriam Karpolov's archive at Evo, so um, yeah, yeah. No, it, we can't uh, we can't overemphasize the significance of that. The the Blankstein book that I translated exists in two places in the United States, Evo and the Yiddish Book Center, which of course is where we have done almost all of our work. Um, we are, uh, I think, out of time. But I want to really thank you for this uh, and thank the audience for joining us in this. And um, we're looking forward to either the next Karpilov uh, translation or really whatever you turn your hand to. Thank you. And thank you so much for having this conversation with me. It really is a, a tremendous pleasure. Total pleasure. Thank you.